In everyday life, we can use a ruler or maybe even a tape measure to help us measure distances. But in aviation, when the distances are a lot bigger, we've got a far more useful bit of kit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the sixth class in the radio navigation series. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at DME or distance measuring equipment. This is a handy bit of equipment that we can use to tell how far away we are from something. And if we combine this with a VOR or an NDB, it can give us some pretty accurate information on where we are in space and how we can get to where we want to go. Distance measuring equipment is a system used in aviation to determine the exact distance between an aircraft and a ground station. It relies on both equipment on the ground and in the airplane to function, which makes it a form of secondary radar. Primary radar is where there's only one bit of equipment that transmits and receives, like a bat using sonar, for example, whereas secondary radar needs both the aircraft and the ground station to transmit and receive signals. So the ground station is uh, typically co-located with a navigational aid like a VOR, NDB, or an instrument landing system, ILS, which we'll look at in the next class. And in the aircraft, there is a DME interrogator that transmits and also receives radio signals as well. Basically, what happens is the DME interrogator on the aircraft sends out a stream of paired pulses as a signal to the ground station on a specific frequency. The pulses are jittered uniquely to each plane. What that means is that each pulse pair in between the pairs is separated by 12 microseconds as standard, but the gaps in between each pairs of pulses is unique. This means that each aircraft has a unique signature in the form of the gaps in between the pulses. On average though, the amount of pulses per second is around 150 until the aircraft is locked on to a DME signal, at which point it drops to 24 pulse pairs per second. So the aircraft fires out this pulse pair signal, which is unique in the forms of the gaps in between the pulse pairs. And the ground station transmits a reply back on a slightly different frequency, but the jittering will be transmitted back. So an aircraft receiver will be able to distinguish its own signal from the ones around it that other aircraft might be using as well. The ground DME station sends back the signal 63 megahertz different in frequency and it's a delay factored in of 50 microseconds. This means that the aircraft receiver can be sure that it isn't a reflection from a mountain uh, of the signal just sent out because the fact that the frequency is different means it can only come from the DME station. The DME system therefore requires two frequencies to operate each separated by this 63 megahertz difference. And these frequencies exist in the ultra high frequency band, which is between 300 megahertz and 3 gigahertz. Uh, and these frequencies are paired together. Those 263 need to be paired together into what we call channels. And these channels are then linked to a VHF frequency. So when you tune in the VHF frequency, the DME channel is automatically tuned by the onboard aircraft equipment if there's a co-located DME that can be used, for example. So you tune up your VOR, it'll go, there's a DME there, the aircraft will automatically choose the channel which is applicable to the uh, co-located DME at that VOR, for example, hopefully that makes sense. To then use the DME, you would have to ident it in the same way that you do any other radio beacon. The DME ident will be sent over the same type of signal as an NDB, VOR or ILS, but will play one in every four at a slightly different pitch. So you get three idents at a lower pitch, then one at a more higher pitch, which confirms that the DME is also tuned. The DME interrogator in the aircraft measures the time it takes for the signal to go back and forth, and then using this time delay in between sending out and receiving a signal, it calculates the slant range based on speed equals distance over time and obviously dividing the distance in half. The distance measured is important to note is slant range, not the horizontal distance over the ground. This seems a bit useless because planes can fly all the way up from the ground up to 30,000 feet and more. So surely this change in height will change the slant range 
and make the distances inaccurate depending on what height you are and change depending on your height, all trigonometry and Pythagoras and stuff. Well, the point is it does, although it doesn't really make all that much difference. Uh, if we look at a basic example, which I've set up here, we're going to do some Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I've done the calculations off screen, but we can know that for option one, which is going to be aircraft uh, A and aircraft B, we're going to have two different figures. We've got to convert them into the same units. So we know there's 6,076 feet in every nautical mile. So for the first example, we've got 607,600 squared plus 20,000 squared. And for the second example, it's 607,600 squared plus 30,000 squared. All those calculations all together, you would get an answer in feet when you convert it back into nautical miles. For the first example, which is the 20,000 feet example, you get a distance of to two decimal places, 100.05. And for the example at 30,000 feet, aircraft B there, you get 100.12 nautical miles. So the 10,000 feet difference makes what? 0 0.7 worth of DME distance, 0 0.07, sorry. And compared to the horizontal distance, we've got maximum 0.12 nautical miles off. So it's calculating slant range, but at long distances, it doesn't really matter. Obviously, when we're getting closer and closer, it's going to make more and more of a difference um, because of the angle being greater. However, when we need to be completely accurate and precise when we're close into the aircraft, such as for landing or takeoff, we're going to be flying on specified procedures called standard instrument departures, SIDS, and standard terminal arrivals, STARS, and also on approach procedures. These procedures will often have a specified DME distance to make turns on, certain VOR courses to be on, and certain altitudes to be at. If these are designed using the slant range from a certain DME, then as long as we follow it, and all the other aircraft are also following the DME slant range, then it doesn't matter. If the leg in between two points is 10 DME long, then we fly until our DME says 10, then make the turn. It doesn't matter if it's 10 nautical miles over the ground because the procedure wasn't around, designed around a 10 nautical mile distance over the ground, but a 10 DME distance on the aircraft, which is slant range. So it doesn't matter as long as you fly the DME distance that it says on the procedure, it'll all work out because it's not bothered about ground range, it's bothered about slant range. Another cool feature that can be built into a DME system is an offsetting of the zero DME distance. This would normally occur overhead the DME where the time delay is really, really short and therefore the distance measured is too small for our equipment to display properly. It might be a measurement of 0 0.05 nautical miles, for example, 0 0.05, yes, but DME distance is normally only ever given to one decimal place. So the minimum distance we could read is 0.1, and therefore it would reset to maybe uh, reading 0.0, .0 on the DME. With offsetting the zero DME point, we can do some useful things. The best example of this is to offset the DME distance so that it reads zero at the runway threshold, even though the DME itself isn't sat at the end of the runway, but somewhere else on the airport. This way we get a nice distance countdown as you approach the runway, on a procedure such as an ILS or maybe even a VUR approach. This offsetting is achieved by reducing the time delay from the standard 50 microseconds. To make this easy to understand, I'm going to use some rough numbers. In reality, it would be fractions of seconds for these distances. But say, for example, at the 50 nautical mile range, the interrogation and response took five seconds to go and come back. This is with the 50 microsecond delay included. So the calculation is made, speed equals distance over time, divided in two, and we get 50 nautical miles. If we reduce the 50 microsecond gap uh, or delay in the reply signal to maybe 25 microseconds, then the pulse and response now takes slightly less time. 
So it will maybe cause the DME to show 49 nautical miles, even though the aircraft is physically still at 50 nautical miles out. So if we do this close into the runway, we can reduce the 50 microsecond delay just by just the right amount to trick the DME into reading zero when the aircraft passes over the runway. So there's a few errors in DME systems that can happen, but generally they're pretty accurate bits of kit. So the first one is basically a signal loss. So if we're flying towards a DME station and we lose the signal temporarily for some reason, then if we keep traveling at the same rate, the DME will reduce or increase as it has been according to that rate. So as long as we keep the same speed, it will remember, it has a memory function built in that if we lose the signal, it'll keep counting down at the same rate we're flying towards it. And then we get the signal back, it'll carry on. Or if we don't have a signal for more than 10 seconds, that will cause maybe a failure flag to pop up or a zero, zero, zero distance or a dashes of lines. That point will be when the DME has failed. Another thing that can happen is saturation. So basically a DME station can become overwhelmed with lots of aircraft interrogating. This would mean that there's lots of aircraft that would not receive the correct pulse pairs back and pretty useless information would be provided. This is why DMEs come with basically a, what we call an automatic shedding system. So it sheds off signals, it gets rid of signals, it disregards them that aren't as strong. So maybe they're too far away or from a weak transmitter. This means that in practice, only the strongest 100 signals uh, and receive replies and distance information. Ground reflections happen if the interrogation signal reflects off a mountain or maybe bounces up to a DME that's slightly higher on the ground, like this example, before getting to the DME. And then the reply will be sent to the aircraft, but will have taken longer to do so because the signal has taken longer to reach the DME and that will show the aircraft being further away because speed equals distance over time, that's a larger time. If we have a clear path to DME as well, then the reflected signal will always arrive back at the aircraft later because it's traveling further. So the plane is built in with a system that only picks up the first signal, the first reply from the DME station per pulse pair. This aircraft will fire out, or the aircraft, sorry, will fire out about 150, uh, reducing to 24 pulse pairs per second. And the first one to come out, out, come back out of each of those individual pulses will be the one that is listened to and used. So as soon as the first pulse pair reply is received, then the receiver stops listening and then it waits the appropriate amount of time delay, that gap in the jittered pattern. And then it switches on, holds its ear back up and says, I'm listening again. Another one comes back, it stops listening, it waits for the appropriate gap, it listens again, and the signal uh, it guarantees that only the first one is ever received, aka the shortest distance, the one without reflections. So there's various systems in place to keep the accuracy of the DME system quite high. We've got the sort of the listening thing here, we've got the saturation, we've got the unique jittering, we've got the memory function and other things which make it very accurate. On old systems, it's accurate to be within 0.25 nautical miles, plus or minus 1.25%. And on newer systems, it's accurate to be 0.2 nautical miles, 95% of the time. So pretty reliable bits of equipment. To summarize then, DME uses the ultra high frequency band from 300 megahertz to three gigahertz. It uses two frequencies, one that gets sent out, 63 megahertz different from the one that uh, is received by the aircraft. They're paired into channels and those channels are linked to VHF frequencies and beacons and the aircraft will automatically tune the channel that is associated with the VHF frequency. The plane will send out a unique signature of signals, pulse pairs. The gap in between each pulse is 12 microseconds, but the gap in between the pulses is unique to each aircraft. So it sends this out to the DME station. The DME waits 50 microseconds and then sends back a signal matching the time delays, but 63 megahertz difference. So you, the aircraft knows that it's getting its signal back instead of another aircraft's back. And it knows it's not a reflection because there's this 63 megahertz difference. Speed distance time calculations are then used. You want to find the distance and then divide it by two, obviously to get the 
this slant range between the aircraft and the receiver. Uh, if you calculate the slant range compared to the ground range, it's going to be very, very similar because of the distances we're talking about at long range. But as we get closer in, it's going to make more of a difference. And it doesn't matter when we're close range and being accurate because all procedures will be designed around slant range rather than horizontal distance over the ground. One of the cool things you can do is you can incorporate a time delay so instead of the 50 microsecond delay, you reduce it down to 0.25, or you could even extend it out to make the zero point of the DME in a different location. So basically what you're doing is you're, normally the time element here has 50 microseconds. If you have a shorter delay, the time is gonna be less, and that's gonna influence the distance. It's gonna make the distance less as well. There's a few errors, signal loss, uh, just losing the signal, but there's a memory system built in that will hold on to a signal, uh, hold on to a DME distance counting down at a certain rate for 10 seconds. Saturation, only the 100 strongest signals get a reply from a DME station. Ground reflections, the signal on the way to the DME station bounces off a mountain or the ground, for example and that means it takes longer to travel to the DME, so the overall time will be longer than the shortest possible direct route. So the aircraft only listens to the first of each pulse pair reply, meaning it's only getting the shortest possible distance between itself and the ground station. These are accurate bits of kit. So you're looking at 0 0.25 nautical miles plus or minus 1.25% for older bits of equipment, and for newer bits of equipment, you're looking at 0 0.2 knock miles 95% of the time. So DMEs, pretty good stuff, give you some pretty accurate information on distance for how far away you are from the station.